happy Future Friday. Sophia, I'm so glad to have you here today. On Future Fridays, we speak with incredible visionary women in the space, really defining the future, really leading transformative technologies and how they are functioning and operating in society and getting hot takes on where we think this is all going. And so your background in particular, it was very cool to meet you at ECC Paris, but you've been like in the orbit, especially even at Suzalu. Um, and talking a lot about civil society and governance and really how we think about blockchain govern governance and institutions. Um, so I'm so excited to dive in with you today. And I'd love if you could kick us off with just where are you calling in from today and what are you focused on? Well, thank you for having me first and foremost. So I'm currently calling you from Thailand. So I spend um, most of my time here in Thailand, although I'm currently working as a researcher at the Blockchain Gov, which is headquartered in Paris, France. Um, so I come and go. And at, at the Blockchain Gov, I'm also basically a PhD candidate uh, through University of Paris Second. So my research is focused on the intersection between blockchain identity and citizenship. But Blockchain Gov as a multidisciplinary research team focuses overall on understanding how blockchain trust, legitimacy, um, constitutions, police centricity all interact with one another. I love that. And so currently you're at Blockchain Gov, but you've had just this really interesting career um, in the space of civil society and identity in a more traditional sense with um, the par parliamentarians for global action and some of your work in Cordoba, which I know you're from uh, Argentinian originally, and then going into Democracy Earth Foundation, which is another nonprofit um, as a consultant with your own, um, as a principal, and then Blockchain Gov. So it's been such a really interesting journey. I'm curious if you could just share, how did you get into this space? How did you kind of start in your like hyper-local um, sphere in Cordoba and then expand out into now like blockchain as a technology for civil society and identity? I, I have a bachelor's in international relations from the University of Cordoba. I also did an exchange in Milano and Many universities in Latin America, including mine, are very progressive in the way they teach. And, you know, they promote critical thinking, critical theories, post-colonialism, post-modernism, feminist theory, obviously Marxist theory. And I think that that really left a mark in me as a young woman. And I was always thinking on how I could have an impact in society through decentralization of power. Um, so. Afterwards, I went to Europe and I did a master's in law and politics of international security. And I started working at, uh, I, I started doing an internship at an NGO, the one you mentioned called Parliamentarians for Global Action. Basically, this NGO gathers together MPs, members of parliament from all over the world to work on human rights issues, um, in my case, alongside the International Criminal Court. So I think it was in 2016 or 17, when I was finishing my internship that I had, it's funny enough, I had a person ask me what I would do with my time if like money wasn't an issue, like what, what I would do with my career, mm -hmm. sort of to spark like my curiosity. And um, that same person told me about Bitcoin. It was like the bull run and asked me to look into cryptocurrencies. And I wasn't that interested in the financial aspect of it all. So I simply Googled um, blockchain for social good. And what I uh, ran into was this white paper of Democracy Earth Foundation that was titled The Social Smart Contract. And that is like a wordplay for smart contract and social contract. And I'm reading through it and basically was making the point of using blockchain technology and smart contracts for organizations of all sizes and types to well, basically make collective decisions and use liquid democracy and use um, smart contracts to sort of automate the distribution of budget and use proof of identity to have one person, one vote systems. And I was like, this is exactly what I want to do. I don't know what this is, but this is what I want to do. So um, so I reached out to them, basically. And I, I reached out to them with a plan. Back then, my plan was um, we have to 
put in motion an, an incremental revolution. Like what you're building sounds pretty anarchist. And I in, internally side with that, with that equation. But I think that maybe it is feasible or better that we just go through different fronts. So we need to pitch this to politicians who might be like open-minded or progressive enough to hear it. And that was sort of like combining well my, with my work at, at the NGO. Um, so I just started doing research for DEF for a, a good couple of years on different topics. And then to complete it all, as I was doing that research, I also started uh, my own, well, I was joining a consultant firm that started out by two good friends. It was a feminist consultant firm on international development. Um, so I think like the common threads to, to my entire profession and, and, and career is, I guess, a, a desire to, to help empower people and decentralize power in all its forms. So, yeah. I love that. Where do you think that comes from? If you look back onto your own personal story, where did that motivation to focus on that as your, your purpose originate? Mm, I think perhaps, uh, that's a good question. I think it could be, you know, as you know, Latin America has the greatest gap between the rich and the poor. So you are raised in an environment where you see how, um, you know, the effects of inequality. And you see how meritocracy in this context is really not, it's more a myth than a reality. Um, it is not that people cannot achieve what they're looking for because of lack of trying. It's simply that there are, you know, systemic uh, forces excluding them from the system, um, uh, pun intended. So I think that through me observing that and understanding that I had certain privileges and disadvantages as well, um, it sort of inspired me to, yeah, to just like elevate the community around me. Um, so I, I, I don't know, I since I was a kid, I'd like to join into uh, programs or activities working in marginalized communities. And I think that accompanied my entire professional life. So interesting. And now that you're doing um, your PhD research, what is your primary topic? What's your focus? So I, what I realized when I joined Blockchain Gov now as a full-time academic researcher is that I am a little bit obsessed with identity. Like decentralization of power is one, but I guess identity is another. Um, also in my personal life, identity and theory now what that is, you know, I, um, I am a bisexual woman and that is something that I'm very open about and because I think there is a politics behind that uh, in the fluidity in which we express our identity. Um, so I think obviously I've been obsessed with the topic and it comes and it's reflected in my thesis as well because it's blockchain identity and citizenship. So what I'm trying to understand particularly is to what extent identity architectures blockchain based can help us promote more inclusive citizenships and understanding that citizenship acts within the state as we know it, right? Like you need like an ID and a passport to represent your status of citizen and then exercise your rights of freedoms. But then citizenship also occurs um, across states. We can talk about like diasporas that are split um, in different states, for example, and beyond the concept of the state. So we can have blockchain communities that are actually trying to put together examples of collectives where you have like a citizenship right and exercise in play. And even we can talk about indigenous groups that also have their own acts of citizenship, even if it is not state-centric. So what I'm seeing is that in blockchain particularly, People are a bit dogmatic when it comes to identity and they choose different camps. So you have self-sovereign identities camp, then you have proof of personhood camp, then you have Solvan tokens camp. And this is just to name a few um, primitives, blockchain identity primitives. And what I'm trying to propose is a methodology to come up with more context sensitive identity solutions. So for that, we need to understand the technology and how we can combine them, but we also have to understand the context in which we're operating and to what extent intervening with technology and which kind of technology can actually be a good or a bad thing. 
And that is not an, an easy question. And that is what I will hopefully have an answer to in the end of, I think, 2025. Yeah, I'm seeing so. <laughs> so you have a little bit of time to come up with yeah. a solution. What is your current sort of hot take or maybe controversial opinion of where you see the world going in terms of identity and citizenship that maybe not everyone would agree with, but is sort of your vision of where the world could be? At at the core, at least what the literature says is that the key problem of identity in decentralized systems, in peer-to-peer systems, is that it is hard to ensure that these systems scale, are secure, and protect privacy at the same time. So mm-hmm. usually one thing has to give. And particularly when we're trying to be, to build systems that are trying to prove uh, the uniqueness and singularity of a person, right? So in a decentralized system, I need to find a way uh, to prove that Sophia only has access to this account or this uh, public address and that I don't have more than one address. That is sort of like the unique and singularity problem. So what we're seeing now with you know, the case of WorldCoin and so forth that I guess like it's something that people know about, but like on a side note, proof of personhood and these protocols existed way before WorldCoin and initiatives existed well beyond them is that whenever we choose to use biometrics in order to ensure uniqueness and singularity, it comes with a lot of concerns on privacy and a lot of concerns on, or a lot of concerns on centralization. Mm -hmm. And that is a problem because those are the two most important values, uh, I would dare say, of the people in in, in that integrate the community, you know, from the cyberpunks to, you know, different kinds and sorts of anarchists. Um, So I don't know where we will be going. I think that I'm seeing uh, a lot of people, activists and thinkers and makers um, making a point for how cautious we have to be on privacy preservation and trying also to change the narrative around privacy on privacy, not only as in a place where we are hiding or protecting ourselves, but also a safe space for connection, which I think is very important to communicate to the bigger audience. Um, but yeah, I, I, I just don't know. I think it's a matter of how how aware we are of the dangers of what we're building and how we can build, you know, chicken balances to promote more accountability for all the new projects that are coming, including obviously WorldCoin, but many others too. So when you think of the landscape, WorldCoin being one that you mentioned, are there people or companies that are really inspiring you right now that others listening right now should follow and dive into? Number one, I would say Kalia Identity Woman. She is that that's how people know her. It's Kalia Young. Um, she is known for basically championing the con- the concept sorry, of self-sovereign identities, which existed also before blockchain. And she's an avid activist and promoter of open standards for the identity layer, basically. Then I'm thinking of Paula Berman, she was my mentor at Democracy Art Foundation. And then she started the Internet of Humans workshop, then called Humanetics, bringing together all the people on proof of personhood. She's now integrating uh, the Radical Exchange team, but she has a lot of knowledge about what I just described, these trade-offs between you know, security and decentralization and um, scalability and privacy. Pooja Olaver also from Getting Plurality. She is the co-author of the DSOC paper on Solvan Tokens paper. And I think she's making a very interesting point on information as power and you know the importance on understanding identity as something that is built intersectionally and the importance on the role of community and in in building identity systems and understanding also, again, the role of decentralization in, in creating these new infrastructures. What do you think has been then the thing that's most exciting to you as you've been learning and exploring this space? And maybe for even somebody who's just getting started and 
potentially hasn't even considered the communities that they're part of or the concept of self-sovereignty and self-sovereign identity. What really is exciting to you, something new that you learned in the process of exploring this space? As a member, again, as a member of Blockchain Gov, uh, in this absolutely amazing team where, where we have we have actually researchers from many universities, from Harvard and MIT. So it's it's literally like an honor just to share the space with them and listen to so many wise voices. What I learned is the importance on the building blocks of decentralized systems that are sort of, they, they're cross-cutting to identity and vice versa. So I give you just like an example to explain my point. For example, we what we learn is that perhaps it is a misuse of the term to call blockchain a trustless technology because what blockchain does is actually a confidence enhancing machine it enhances confidence that the code will be executed as it is written because of its technological features but you still need trust trust means that the agent has the capacity to default on a promise and what it means is that we build the systems that are technically disintermediated, but we are still relying on the trust we place upon different stakeholders. And that can mean, you know, software developers, that can mean miners and validators, and so forth. And we see this now, for example, with the curve finance case, right? On, you know, placing the reliance on the devs, and then they build like a buggy compiler and whatnot. And then what happens um, then in, in that project, and then how it expands over others in the DeFi ecosystem. So that is one thing. Another thing that I learned that I think is interesting is that legitimacy. So the reason why people accept to belong to an organization is important for centralized systems and decentralized systems as well. So it's not only a concept for like states or, you know, um, corporations, but also blockchain systems. Um, why? Because since it, it is so easy it is easier to exit the systems versus states. It is easier for you to change from Bitcoin to Ethereum than it is for you um, to change your country, right? In terms of like how costly it is, then it is very important for the systems to gain legitimacy and be, being perceived as such in order to, to attract loyal users. And because of network effects, it means that the systems gain value the, the more people actually partake in them. So understanding how legitimacy works from like traditional systems can give us uh, a vocabulary and a lens through which we can understand how it works in this in, in decentralized systems as well. And I think like an, a third one to finish, for example, could be thinking of blockchain that many call as a legal, sort of like a technology that it is blurring the boundaries of legal frameworks in terms of time and space and subject and actions because of the way it works. Like you cannot really stop um, smart contracts that are, for example, still operating on IPFS. That doesn't mean that a blockchain system is completely immune to the state. And we see it, for example, with Tornado Cash, they may not be able to stop a smart contract for being executed, but they can actually in actually go after people that they deem to be related to it. So all of these like very like boring concepts that come from social sciences and academia actually, and hopefully help us understand a little bit better how the technology operates and the benefits and, and some of the things we have to be cautious about. What advice would you give to somebody getting started? Somebody trying to understand identity and and civil society um, and blockchain? I would say if you want to work in this space and, and make this your passion uh, and your career, I would ask three questions. I would basically do this, like know yourself and know your community and know your environment, I guess. So know yourself, basically understand what is motivating you to be part of this ec ecosystem is it a specific idea and is it is it an ideal just as for example i mentioned decentralizing power or is it just making money nothing nothing bad with just making money but it will lead you to different parts within the ecosystem and the second point is what what topics are you sort of like inherently interested in? Like I said, I was already obsessed with identity from a young age. And then three, what skills 
do you have what things you're good at, right? Like some people are good at communication, some people are good at project management, some people are good at research. So that is a little bit to understand yourself and your motivations. And then I will look into the ecosystem. I would literally do this a great exercise, a stakeholders mapping, because our community is built in such a polycentric way. We have different autonomous and interrelated centers that um, it's good to map them and understand them, right? We have practitioners that are building stuff, and then we have academics, we have lawyers, we have media, we have investors, and it's good to understand who is doing what and how they relate to one another to get also inspired on how you can partake and participate, and then also understand your environment, meaning understand how your sort of legal, political, cultural, social, immediate environment is interfacing with blockchain, right? Sometimes some 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 people, for example, if you are in the US, you will have a different perception on how those relate to one another and affect one another than if you live in Latin America or in Europe. And that can also catalyze a uh, curiosity for you to to operate in this industry in one position or another. With that, how can we keep in touch with you personally? I know you're you speak on the topic, you you share um, your research, and then also just as you produce this um, the work that you're doing in your PhD and beyond, how can we keep in touch with everything that's coming out uh, and that you're working on? Yeah, I think I use I use Twitter a little bit uh, I, and LinkedIn and Sofia Cosar, that's my first and last name. And then on the website of blockchain.gov, you can also um, keep in touch and updated with the things that we're publishing and the reading groups that, that we have for people to join whenever they feel it's an interesting topic for them. Amazing. Well, we'll definitely be keeping in touch and following along. So thank you so much, Sophia, for everything that you shared. I can't wait to see what you come to and what you discover as a solution or proposal in the next few years. That's really exciting. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.